Jay Baba. Uh, I'm Roger Stevens, and uh, I found out about Baba in 1969. Uh, and that's a, an interesting little story. Um, my parents are Bill and Peggy Stevens, and many of you know that they are, they've been Baba lovers since that year also. Um, what you may not know is how me, one of the, they had four kids, and I'm, I'm the second oldest, and uh, I was living at home at the time that Baba came into our lives. My older brother wasn't, and my younger sisters were quite a bit younger than me. They, they fit into the story, but probably not into this particular story. Um, so my dad was a, an ardent seeker of God, extremely ardent, passionate seeker of God, those of you that have known him. And I was a teenager. I was 15, 16 years old, and my father and I were experimenting with drugs. We actually took LSD together once, I remember. Uh, but we were, se we were seeking God, there's no doubt. I wasn't particularly seeking God, I just knew that I was seeking higher stuff. So um, at the age of 16, uh, in 1969, my dad was, as I said, had, we'd been exploring all kinds of mystical avenues. And my dad was working at, in Miami, Florida, where we lived, was working at the Miami Sequarium. And that was where Flipper came from. So a lot of people know who Flipper is, a dolphin. Well, that dolphin, some of you may not know, was trained by a man named Rick O. Feldman. And Rick was a Bible lover. And we didn't know it. He was just a wonderful man that we spent time with. And I loved to swim with the dolphins and do all those kinds of things. Well, Rick went to the Great Darshan. And so he was gone from work for a period of time and came back. And my dad was fascinated that he'd gone to India. So he said, Rick, why did you go to India? He said, well, I'm a father, follower of Mayor Baba. And I went, and Baba has just recently dropped his body. And I went to the, la the Great Darshan. So my dad asked him all these different questions. And Rick, who, by the way, goes by Rick O'Berry. If you try to find him on, on uh, Facebook or the web, that's his name today, Rick O'Berry. But Rick had, uh, he gave a copy of God Speaks to my dad. Now, some people might think that's an odd choice because uh, it's fairly opaque in terms of accessibility for the public in a lot of ways. It's incredible work. But it was perfect for my dad. My dad's a scientist. He was an agnostic. He didn't know if God existed or not. He'd never seen God, never met God, and never had an experience that he knew was God. But a real scientist. He was a real, real scientist. Dr. William Stevens. He took God Speaks home, and he had also studied speed reading. Remember Evelyn Wood's speed reading? He studied all that. He read God Speaks in two to three days in his office with the door closed. I didn't know this, but he came out at dinner on about the second or third day and says, Mayor Baba is God. Only God could have written this book. And I did like this. My mom was rolling her eyes. Uh, the other, my, my sisters were like, glancing at each other because he'd been on so many, he'd kundalini yoga and he'd done meditation and all these things that in his search, and some of them were pretty out there, uh, occult stuff, Annie Ledbetter and all these people. So we just, okay, what's this about? And that's, that's the main event that I remember. Now, the way Baba works, as you know, there was a lot, a tremendous amount of interest in Baba right around the time he dropped his body. And so I suddenly found out during those few days following that that I knew several Baba people. One was a woman named Adair Allspock who went by Missy Allspock. She was uh, betrothed to uh, another Baba lover that many of you know who is Tom Fortson. The point of the story is she had a younger sister who was my sister's friend. And she gave a couple of Baba cards to my sister to bring home. And on the back it was written, for the Stevens family. And I remember the first time I saw a Don't Worry, Be Happy card, 
I was like, what's he the mayor of? And the other thing I remember was he didn't look like any of the gurus that I had, had seen and, and studied in, in the recent years. He just looked like my grandfather or the local pizza guy. He seemed, he just didn't seem like, like a guru or a master or whatever. But I remember very well looking at that card and holding it and that it just struck a note within me. But I wasn't all that interested. Now, my mother was raised a Methodist and she was rock steady in our family. She cooked all the meals, did all the cleaning. Dad was the workhorse. He was driven. He wrote and photographed and lectured and studied all the time. So mom kind of held the family together. She also was not flighty at all. So when he announced that Mirababa was God, I could see this was going to be an interesting situation. Well, she had numerous talks with, with Dad, and Dad, as I said, was convinced immediately of Baba's godhood. So he began to write to Kitty and Elizabeth and Jane and Fred Ella, uh, and they were very impressed that he was a scientist, a doctor, and he's interested in Baba. I remember them, them being, you know, oh, Dr. Stevens, you know. And anyway, he talked my mom into going to the Mayer Center and that was Thanksgiving, so November of 1969. And for us kids, we stayed home. For us kids, it was like, mom will take care of it. Mom's going, she'll check this out, you know, and it'll be all right, because he's done weird things before. Mom's gonna, you know, check it out. Well, when they came back, <sighs> mom was just, she knew. And that's what was powerful because dad had done so many things that we were just like, oh, we can't keep up with all that. But when mom knew, Peggy knew that Baba was the real deal. And so when she came home, it was like, you kids have got to go to the center. You, you, this, is, this is the real deal. This is the real deal. So I, I, we didn't get to go because of school and all this and the, the holidays were upon us. So we'd, I didn't go to the center uh, with my sisters and my parents until June of 1970. And then I was there for my 17th birthday. I was on center. I do recall that. I was thinking about this last night. Oh, that's right. I had my first, my 17th birthday here. So I was a uh, arrogant, feisty, you know, young man. Uh, but I was bowled over. I think the things that really, really shook me was primarily Kitty and Elizabeth, primarily Kitty. I had never met an old person that I wanted to be around and talk to. Kitty rocked my world. I, I, I was quickly convinced that she was a conduit for, for Baba. Uh, just the way she would, when we were talking, she would get this faraway look and it was almost like Baba was speaking in her ear. I had never experienced anything like that. It wasn't put on at all. But she was literally, Baba was, you know, talking to me through her, I felt, in those days. Well, anyway, that was a very powerful experience. It was so early in the days of the center, there was no gateway or anything. Fred and Ella were out of town. We stayed at Pine Lodge. Uh, so our, our, my first nights on the center were at Pine Lodge, which was pretty interesting. An older building, on, many of you know where that was, on center. But after that... It was pretty much all she wrote for me. So I don't have a long coming to Baba story. I do have some pretty remarkable events I want to relate to you and things that Baba did to change my life. A, changing a 17-year-old's life is, is a pretty tall order, but it was a piece of cake for Baba. All he had to do was just give me one little sample of his love, and I, I had never, never known anything like that. Now, I want to go back in time just a little bit to tell you a absolutely delightful story. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old, we were living in a southern part of, of, of Miami, Homestead area. My dad was writing full-time for uh, periodicals, for publications. He would write articles about the ocean, about the sea, about shells, about currents, about fish and sharks. And, and he was also a pioneering uh, scuba diver, by the way. This was a early 60s and he was using scuba. I remember for my sixth birthday, 
And he actually gave me a small scuba tank, uh, and we went. I went scuba diving at sea. You know, they didn't have you know uh, licensing for <laughs> registration or anything. But um, I digress. So he was working on an article. He'd gotten a contract with Reader's Digest to write an article about pearls. As you know, Reader's Digest was the largest circulation magazine in the entire world in the 60s. It was everywhere. It was in all doctor's offices and by far the largest circulation periodical. So when Dad was contracted to uh, do an article about pearls, he was, he, he was ecstatic. Here was it was the big time for him. He had written so many books at that. He had written several books and lots of articles at that time, but nothing on the, a level of Reader's Digest. So he plunged in with, with uh, great fervor, and he wrote a nice article about pearls. He sent them back to, sent the article back to Reader's Digest, and they sent it back and said, eh, it's a little too technical. You need to kind of bring it down to the public's level, you know, because you're a great scientist and you know all about the sea, but let's make this a little bit more human. So he rewrote it, and then they rejected it again. And I remember this because it was trauma in our house. You know, oh, you know, oh, I've got to do this and it's not working out and what am I doing wrong? Well, mom, who is ever the quieting influence, ever the st stable, steady one, after the second time of rejection, she said, Bill, you know, I work for you editing and proofreading and all that. Why don't you let me try to warm this article up, make it more accessible to the public? And he, my dad was at wit's end, but I remember this story very clearly. By the way, this story is written up in dad's uh, book, uh, Footprints in the Sand. Uh, but I have a little insight to it, obviously. So my mom worked on the article and my dad felt it only right to add her byline. So the book for the first time, I mean the article for the first time was written by Bill and Peggy Stevens instead of just William M. Stevens, Dr. William M. Stevens, which everything previously had been. And that's, that's important as you'll see in the story. So anyway, the check came and life went on, all good. Fast forward 30 years, okay? In 1969, which was a good eight, 10 years after this article was written, found out about Baba, all that started. And my parents uh, continued working, but as many of you know, that we began to have Baba meetings at our house in Miami. And we, they would be attended by 30, 40, 50 people every week in our house. Uh, many of your friends came to Baba, that Rich D'Amato, Arsenio Rodriguez, on and on and on. I could tell you huge lists of people that, that came in those days to our house and I met them and uh, I was on fire too. The whole thing was happening just breathtakingly fast and rich. We had Alan Cohen came from California and spoke. Just everyone who was in town it was in any way associated with Baba would come to meetings in our house. We had music, original music all the time and it was a really great situation. So fast forward as I said, more into the 80s and 90s. And my parents, uh, at this point, were going to India just about every year because they could. They could afford to do it, and they, they were doing that. And um, they went and, let me check my notes here. Oh, one more thing. Uh, my mother was born on July 9th, 1925, the very morning in India that Baba began his silence. The very same one, not a year, not a day different, but that day. So it was the 10th of July in India. My mother was born in the U.S. in, in Georgia on July 9th. So we always thought that was kind of funny. My mom was uncomfortable with it, though, because when she told people, then they'd know how old she was. She was a little bit vain like that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so my parents, as I said, were going regularly to India at that point uh, in the, uh, I think this was 1994. So it was approximately, um, let's see, 30, 30 years after he had written this article for, uh, and it was 50 years from the time my, my parents got married. So they were in India for their 50th wedding anniversary. 
Well, when they got there, Monty came out to greet them. Came, they went to Merazad, and Monty came out to greet them and says, I've got a surprise for you. And she says, what do you know about the romance of the pearl? And my mom goes, you mean the Reader's Digest? Well, what had happened was uh, there was a young woman that uh, many of you may know as um, Laurel McGreeny was in India at the time with Monty. And I, uh, Mira had just passed. And, and so she had, they had a lot of magazines were trying to clean things out. And Laurel found this copy of uh, Reader's Digest. And she flipped through it and she saw the article on pearls. And she figured, oh, that must, that must be why Mira kept this. And then she noticed the name. I wonder, she says, and she took it to Monty and says, is this our Bill and Peggy? And Monty didn't have any idea about this whatsoever. And she goes, oh, I think it is. It must be. He was oceanographer. You know, so. Turns out that Mara was so taken with this article that she showed it to Baba. And Monty read passages of this to Baba in 1963. Obviously, when my parents heard this, they were just a puddle on the floor. On their 50th anniversary, Baba had given them this most precious gift. And it also settled one thing. We would sometimes sit around the dining table and go, why has Baba touched our family so? What could this be? What could the connection, what could the link be? And they used to imagine, because they lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that Baba had driven by their house on the way to Ruby Falls with the, with the women Mondale on the way across to Oklahoma, out to California. And they knew that Baba had, it was, they lived right there. My, my, my dad's parents lived right on Highway 64. So they knew that Baba had to have passed right by there. Maybe that's the link. Maybe he, we met eyes. He used to, we used to sit around the dinner. Why was Baba so gracious to my family? The whole family and his sisters and their friends and, and all of our friends you know, that came to Baba, it was astounding. So when we found this little gem of a story out, it, it, uh, it, I don't know if it made more sense or it was just a very unique, sweet thing that Baba gave them on their 50th anniversary. So uh, as I said, my mother was a real stable one. My dad was the fire, the passion, also a great writer. And so they were the perfect combo to have these, these Baba meetings. Um, during that time, I, was, uh, I had a harder time coming to Baba than my parents did, and I continued to smoke dope and things like that. Uh, I do remember, <laughs> this is a scandalous one, I was on the way to see Adi, C Adi Jr. and Mergie at the University of Miami. They were giving a talk at the University of Miami, and on the way there, I was smoking pot. <laughs> and I remember another Baba lover had gone by, and I grinned, and they said, they shook their head, oh, you know, and I said, oh, that's right, this isn't allowed. <laughs> But anyway, Adi and Mergy had come there, so the, things were really happening in Miami. The, the, uh, the Baba group uh, frequently met uh, in North Miami, central, central North Miami, at a place called the Wagon Wheel, which was where they held square dances. And the old-time Baba lovers from Miami were Irwin and Eddie, uh, Luck, uh, Ann Forbes, uh, Ada Schifrin, uh, a number of old-timers that were there, uh, but not that many young people. The young people were coming during those days and uh, they came in force. And eventually we got booted out of, of that uh, establishment when they found out we were uh, following some weird guru, I think was the, what happened. But uh, we started having the meetings at our house. There was also a chapter in there where we had a bookstore in North Miami called the Mayor Baba Bookstore. And uh, Sally Mendoza, Sally Katz was instrumental in this and Ed Short and Irene Short were instrumental in this. Um, so we had a, a bookstore up there for a while and that, that folded after a while. But the museum, the, the meetings at our house went on for many years until uh, 74 or so, uh, maybe 75 even, at which time my parents moved to North Carolina and uh, uh, started a different chapter of their lives. But those, those were golden years in Miami. So many people came to our house that were interested in Baba. So after I, I, after I fully accepted Baba, which didn't take very long at all, I was, uh, I was enchanted with art, and uh, I, although I hadn't to ever taken any classes in high school, when it came time for college, I knew I wanted to study art, and so I did. 
And I remember having one of my first conversations with Baba, and it went something like this. Oh, Baba, you are God in human form. I can't. I'm not a very good artist. If I'm going to make images of you, I've got to be a better artist. How do I, how do, I do that? And Baba kind of, you know, just naturally it was college. Go, go the academic route. Become a better artist. Because that, if that's what you feel you need to do. And so I did. And I, I went to, uh, I got a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in painting. But really for me, that those, the initial drawings of Baba that I did were so crude <laughs> that I was a little embarrassed. I would literally trace photographs of Baba on tracing paper and people loved them and they wanted them. And I was like, but it's just, oh, you know, I was kind of embarrassed. They're just tracings of, of me. So I remember that conscious decision that I'm going to be a real artist so I can paint real paintings of Baba. And so I did, did that whole academic route. So that's, that's part of my coming to Baba's story. Um, in 1973, I had known of Baba for three or four years at that point. I had a close friend who had also come to Baba on Key Biscayne. His name was Scott O'Neill. Many of you know him. And we were good buddies growing up on Key Biscayne. Uh, there are several others associated, but for this story, that's, that's good enough. Scott and I had decided we wanted to go to India. And now my parents hadn't been to India at this point. But I was determined. I'd heard that people go overland to India. And I said, I can do this. You know, I'm a tough kid. I can, I can travel over to India. So uh, Scott and I uh, each bought a ticket on Icelandic Airways for $200 round trip from New York. And from there, we decided we would hitchhike to India uh, by hook and crook, by train, bus, whatever. And so we took off. I think each of us had $800 or $900 plus a ticket, round trip ticket to, to Europe. And uh, you could actually do it in those days, especially if you went overland. It was, it was very reasonable. Once you got out of Europe, everything was, was very inexpensive. So we took off, traveled through Europe, down through Italy, went to Assisi, found uh, Baba's cave. Charles Haynes had, had given Scott and I a map. This is hand drawn. This is how you find Baba's cave in Assisi. Uh, then we went to the south of south of, uh, of Italy, took a ferry over to Corfu, and then and then up to Istanbul, and then started across the Middle East. Uh, Scott and I didn't get along too good because uh, traveling is very stressful, as you know. And I was very full of myself. I knew what I wanted to do. I was one pointed. Scott wanted to stop in Germany and visit some places because he was he was born of a uh, he was a military brat, and he, his he had had been, uh, I think he was actually born in Wiesbaden, which is uh, where an uh, American base was in, in Germany. And I refused. I said, oh, I'm, go I'm going to India. I don't want to do, you know. So we had a little, you know, friction. And that kept up. Uh, I do remember something interesting about Istanbul. We were traveling with a lot of other travelers on this eastern journey, the Orient Express, so to speak. One guy says, well, when I get to Istanbul, I'm going to have a big, juicy hamburger. I was a vegetarian. So was Scott. Uh, but I decided to break my, my vegetarian because I couldn't find anything that was made with meat in Turkey. <laughs> so uh, that was curious. But then we took off across Turkey and we made it uh, to Tehran in Iran. Uh, so we were, we were well on our way. And while we were there in the hotel, Scott had, was taking a nap. I had w gone out and wandered the streets of Tehran. As I came back in the afternoon, there was a young man, there was a, a man, not so young, with a big beard, long blonde hair, tacking a notice up on, at the hotel, have room for one rider to South India in my VW van. Only one space, because apparently they'd lost one person in, on their trip or something. So I was like, oh my God, that would be so wonderful. I don't have to deal with public transportation and staying in hotels and all that, all that stuff. So. I tried to do the right thing, so I said, look, I'm traveling with somebody. I've got to go talk to them first, but please take the notice down. I'll be right back after I talk to my friend. So I went and woke Scott up, and I said, Scott, most amazing thing has happened. I found transportation for one of us to, to Central or South India at no just covering expenses, gas and food, you know, in, 
in, in the van with this guy. And there were also two other passengers from Wales, a young couple. So there were four of us in a, a VW van. He had a, a spare motor. He had everything spare. I don't know how that VW van got over some of those passes, especially going into Afghanistan. I can't, it, it, it was so loaded down. We would just putter up these mountains but had wonderful experiences. He was into kundalini yoga. His master was in South India, and he would just sing lovely bhajans and, and, and uh, uh, spiritual songs all the time. It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. I won the toss. Scott went on by public transportation, and I went on with Ashley Robinson. They took me as far as some amazing stories. I can't go into them all now, but anyone has ever been overland to India in those days must have just wonderful, outrageous stories. I've, I've heard quite a few. So they took me as far as Nagpur in central India and let me out and went to the train station and caught a train to Ahmednagar and showed up at uh, uh, pretty much unannounced. <laughs> <laughs> at the trust office, and uh, I took lodging at the Dalit. As, as many of you know, that was a, uh, somewhat of a nightmare. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I was surrounded by Baba, Baba people that were in India, you know, for Baba. Uh, Gary Kleiner was staying there, Virginia Small, Lori Bloom, who's uh, 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 Lori Aiken Bloom, was there before she was married to Richie. Um, Rich Tomato, uh, Rob Tomorrow, uh, lots, of, lots of people that you know were in there. This was 1973, and I arrived in India in October or November, early November, I believe. And uh, so I get to India. All I want to do is go to the Samadhi. I think that's the most important. I've been, I've been traveling for months here. I want to go to Mirabad and go to Samadhi. So I went out in the courtyard there at the Dalit and I asked people, how do I, do, how do I, you know, oh, you take a rickshaw. And so Virginia and Lori go, oh, we're going there now. You can ride with us. <laughs> well, I thought that was a great idea, except that I was, it was the, the apex of my life. I'm going, and all they did was chatter the whole way. And the three of us in the rickshaw, it's pretty hard to get away. Uh, but they just made small talk the entire time going out there. And I was like, oh, Baba, oh, Baba, I just want to, you know, be in silence with you, let us off at the bottom of the hill. And I tried my best to go up the hill faster than they would. But every time I started walking faster, they'd try to catch up, you know. And I was going, Baba, 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 I just want to, you know, I thought that I was going to have some divine revelation when I got to the Samadhi. And I was like, Baba, Baba, I just want to be alone. And he laughed. I, I can see him laughing because that wasn't to happen. They stayed with me right up to the Samadhi. And I went into the Samadhi, and as frequently happens when I'm in the Samadhi, I had absolutely no experience whatsoever. It was just another place. I bowed down, and many of you, in fact, Steve Klein writes about this in, in one of his poetry books. Every thought that comes through your mind is garbage. You're thinking about food, you're thinking about sex, you're thinking about... Uh, the irritation of having these women with you when you're trying to be silent. All these things were popping into my mind. I'm sitting there, oh, this is Baba's Samadhi. This is the most sacred place. I, I need to get these out of my monkey brain, I think is what Steve Klein calls it. Uh, and, and I just couldn't help but laugh because I got nothing. The interesting thing is, I don't think I've ever gotten anything in Baba's Samadhi in the dozens of times I've been there. I think it's because I've never had an occult experience. I've never had had a vision, physical vision of Baba. I've never, I rarely have ever had even dreams of Baba. A few very powerful ones that I remember quite well, but I'm not the kind of person that gets those kinds of experiences. In the Samadhi, I had nothing. Uh, it was just like Lagoon Cabin. I figured Baba Samadhi. Eh, it's, I feel it's great. I feel you know, closer to Baba. But so that was that was uh, that was my first trip to India. During my first trip to India, I had traveled to Goa when the weather started to get hot. So it must have been in March or so, but right before I came back, because I, I, that's what it was. Many people were leaving because it was very hot. And I decided to go to Goa, and there was this other Baba lover there by the name of Anne. I don't, I don't recall her last name. We traveled by steamer from Bombay to Goa, 
and then stayed for a few days and then uh, we parted ways and when we did I was on my own I just had my backpack and so I took the steamer back from Goa to Bombay well I don't know if it's I know it's Baba but I don't know if it partly was because I was traveling alone but he started giving me incredible grace just showering me with unbelievable coincidences that I'll never forget I befriended a man on the boat it turns out that this man his father was a uh, industrialist and he had lots of money and he was a member of the Royal Bombay Yacht Club and th this was a young man it was the son of this guy and uh, he said well when we get to Bombay what do you do and I said well I was just I heard that you could sleep at the zoo in Bombay and that they wouldn't bother you and then tomorrow I'm just gonna go third class train back to Ahmednagar uh, I told him a little bit about Baba but that's not really part of the story he didn't seem to be very much interested in Baba but he took me with him, him to the Bombay Yacht Club which is really right out of the 19th century big rattan chairs uh, uh, gin and tonics and palm trees and it's it was in the shadow of the big Taj Mahal right right in that neighborhood uh, very old building and I thought I was in some kind of a, uh, a romantic dream from the 19th century and uh, more things happened uh, the, the industrialists friend met the young man and said oh he insisted on taking him out to dinner and he says well my friend here I said oh, I'm just gonna go to you know oh no no you must come they took me to this restaurant called the Ritz and it was the Ritz I had never been in a fancier restaurant I mean the dessert trays were just unbelievable a floor show everything and they paid for everything and then they asked where I was staying and I says well I'm not really I was just gonna take a cab to the I, I just have to have a place to sleep and then I'm getting oh that's what we can't do that the guy bought me a hotel room <laughs> a total stranger now this wasn't the man I was traveling with this was just a friend of a friend and I was just like oh Baba this is so powerful I got up in the morning the man was gone so I checked out of the hotel and I don't remember if I walked or took a, a taxi to Victoria Terminix but I got into there and I, want, I bought a ticket since I had saved so much money I didn't have to buy the night before dinner I didn't have a pay for a place to sleep all these things had been just showered on me and I was really low on funds but I had enough money for a first class ticket to Amundnagar on the train and so I said oh this is my chance to go first class you know so I went out on the first class platform the train was waiting at the station and, but it, was, it wasn't leaving for 20-30 minutes and uh, so I had this idea. So I go along, along the train until I see a car that has an, an elderly Brahmin gentleman in it. And he's glasses down on his nose and reading the newspaper. I said, that's what I need. So I get onto that car and I go, excuse me, good sir. I said, I am uh, traveling on this train, Tom and Nagar, and uh, would you watch my pack while I run and get a pack of BDs to smoke for the trip? And uh, he says, yes, yes, of course, but you must hurry because I am not going on this train. He says, I work in the station and I am only here taking my break. And this is a nice quiet place for me to take my break and read the newspaper. I said, I'll be right back. Thank you so much. I put my back there. I was totally trusting. I am to this day. <laughs> Ran out, got a pack of beaties, went back to the car. And <laughs> the man... I could tell he was like, oh gosh, another hippie, you know, from the U.S. or whatever. And so he, because they are so generous and warm and this is the way they do things, he pushed his glasses up and put the newspaper away and, and decided to give me the time of day for a few moments, which I thought was very sweet because he obviously didn't, we didn't have a lot in common. He says, what is the purpose of your trip to my country? You remember that? They always used to ask that in the old days. And I said, oh, well, I'm a follower of Mayor Baba, and I'm, 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 come, I'm going to Amunnagar, and I've been staying with his Mandali in Amunnagar. The shock on his face. He just turned pale and just went, oh, you know Mayor Baba? I said, well, I don't know him. I mean, I, mean, I, I follow him. I know his Mandali. And he goes, I met Mayor Baba. He says, Mayor Baba gave darshan when I was a young man in Bombay, and I saw Mayor Baba. 
and his whole demeanor completely changed. And then he had nothing but time for me. And I traveled at that point, this is 73, 74 now, uh, with a, a, a sketch pad. And I had done many, uh, I, I would write couplets from op-eds that I found or anything, and I would sketch Baba and the Samadhi, and I had a, a drawing of Allah I had done, and other things like that. Uh, so I showed him to them, to him. <laughs> Each page he turned, he would go, <gasps> and he would touch his hand to the, to the drawings of Baba. I was just blown away. I, I knew that Baba had sent this man to me, and, and in some ways had sent me to him. And this went on for a few minutes, and then the train whistle goes, and he had to leave. But he had, I just tore out his favorite picture of Baba and handed it to him out of my sketch pad. And he held it like this, and it was like so precious to him. And I, he says, how, oh, at, at some point during that conversation, he said, he asked me, how, how, do you, how, do you love, how do you follow Baba? How do you love Baba? I'd never really been asked that before. And I said, well, uh, I just try to remember him as much as I can, and I, I make drawings, and that's when I showed him my drawings and all this. And he, I said, all I know is that he is, that he is the source of all love and that I love him. And that's what I try to keep in the forefront of my mind. So when he gets up to leave, he, he holds his hands together and he goes, he goes down to my feet to touch my feet. Now, uh, I'm not sure who told me. I think it was Padre or somebody said, it may have been Monty. said, never let anyone touch your feet. He says, in India they will because they think you're exalted because you're with Baba, they may try to touch your feet. Never let them touch your feet. So I pulled my feet, <laughs> pulled my feet back and I said, no, 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 it's all about Baba, it's just Baba. And he, he stands up and he goes, just love me, Baba, and walks away. And it was a powerful, powerful experience. I think one reason was I traveled all over in India and never met a stranger who knew Baba. So I was already resigned to the fact that not everybody in India knew who Baba was. They, they would say things like, oh, yes, there is Baba this and Baba that. You know, you heard that so many times. But this man actually had, had Baba's darshan. So Baba sent me to him to rekindle that is the only thing I could think. And he completely rocked my world with that little meeting. And I got back and I ended up in telling that story in Mondali Hall with Erich and Mani there. And they were just enthralled by the story. And to me, it was just a simple thing. There was no miracle. There was no uh, uh, astral, no, no, no event, really. It was just a simple meeting on a train between two strangers. But it was very precious to me. Uh, and they agreed. And they were glad that I, that I told that story. Yeah. Fast forward until Christmas. Uh, I was writing home to my parents and uh, regularly and saying, oh, this is the most wonderful place. You've got to come here. My new best friend is a woman named Mansari Desai. And I spend much time with her. Every, every time I'm at Mirabad, I just hang with her. And I had wonderful uh, experiences hanging and, and telling stories. And she would always say to me, oh, you've got to go home and bring your parents. She would say that just about every day before I'd leave. And uh, so I'm, I'm there, and it's Christmas Eve. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm under the open shelter that's next to the Samadhi, and I've got my, my uh, easel and my paint. I'm painting a, a painting of the Samadhi. And uh, I see this bus coming up the hill, literally coming right up the hill. It's, not, it's more common these days, but back then vehicles really didn't come up the hill. Big bus pulls over by the Samadhi, and it's the Sufis from California, and they chartered a bus from Pune to come there. And I'm sitting there and I'm shaking my head. I go, oh, God, couldn't they walk up the hill? <laughs> That's the kind of thing that goes on in my mind. You know? <laughs> Silly, but. Uh, and as I'm watching them and kind of smiling and continuing my pain here, I, he I hear this, Jai Baba, Roger! It was my dad. My father and mother had, caught, had, unknown to me, booked a flight to India and had, had caught the bus with the Sufis. There were two seats left, so they rode from Pune to Mirabad with the Sufis, and they were on that bus. My dad's hanging out of the window. I was in such shock. Oh, I had already been telling Mansari, oh, Mansari, this is the first Christmas I'd ever been away from my parents. And uh, <laughs> so I was 
I was just, oh, oh, oh. The first words that came out of my mouth were, Mansari. I didn't go up and greet my parents. I was yelling to Mansari. I said, you're not going to believe they came. And, and she going, acha, you know. <laughs> but that was very funny. My, my dad was just cracked up. He says, he didn't call out to us. He called out to Mansari <laughs> not on that first experience. Uh, so anyway, I had a very eventful uh, first trip to India. And uh, uh, my parents, uh, I, had, I really wasn't looking forward to going back overland. I had been in India until February or March, so I had been there four or five months. And uh, uh, my parents gave me some money to, to catch a flight from uh, Bombay. Uh, let's see, I think it was. To, no, to get back to Europe. And then I took the other end of my flight, but this time I was able to change it from New York to Nassau. And then I caught a quick puddle jumper over to Miami where we lived, which is a whole lot easier than coming back down from New, from New York. And one th curious thing, I was exhausted, but I was still hitchhiking when I could because I never had a driver's license until I was 24 years old. <laughs> That's a little secret for you. I bet you don't know many people that, that haven't had a driver's license until they're 24. So I, when I got to the Miami International Airport, I, I was so ready to go home to, my, to Key Biscayne, where I lived with my parents. And uh, so I took a cab, and I said, I'd like you to take me to Key Biscayne. And I'd never taken a cab before. And as I'm sitting in the cab, I'm watching the dollars click off as I'm going from the airport to Key Biscayne. And so when we got to the causeway, there's a big, long bridge that goes out to Key Biscayne. I said, you know what, I can't afford this. It was already up to $20, I believe. And that was a fortune for, for a man that just came back from, you know, just living hand to mouth in India. So I said, can you just let me off here? I'll, I can get home from mine. He said, okay. And he thought I was crazy. And so I'm standing on the side of the road with my backpack hitchhiking. And this uh, young man in a sports car picks me up, sits out, I throw my backpack and <laughs> He says to me the typical question, he says, where are you coming from? <laughs> So I just laughed out loud, and I says, you wouldn't believe it. And I told him just a few snippets that I had been on the other side of the world a couple days ago, and now I'm getting home, but I couldn't afford the taxi home, so I took hitchhiking to get home. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So my parents moved uh, from Key Biscayne to North Carolina in 74 and 75. Because I was at, uh, I was studying art at the University of Miami, where my dad was working at the time. I had a large tuition remission, uh, so I was only paying one quarter of the uh, standard tuition to go to the University of Miami, which is a very expensive school. Um, and they they managed. After my parents left and moved to North Carolina, I applied for a scholarship, and they gave me a 50% scholarship in art because I was a pretty good budding artist at that point I believe I, I got the scholarship anyway but it was still a small fortune for me uh, I didn't have a job you know to speak of or of any kind so I uh, I had good Baba friends Curtis and Carol Wood who were living in the mountains of Western North Carolina where Curtis was a professor and I was I was interested in going to that school but out-of-state tuition was high, but I realized, oh, wait a minute. This is before computers. My parents live in North Carolina. How does anyone in North Carolina not know that I'm not living with them? So I applied for in-state tuition and gave my parents' address, and I got into college at Western Carolina University, which, which is where Curtis and Carol lived. And uh, <laughs> I remember that the tuition and room and board at Western Carolina University was less than half of the tuition at the University of Miami. So I could totally afford it. So I went and I continued my education there until I got a, a bachelor's degree. I met my wife uh, the same year I, I graduated, Wanda Temple. And she, the interesting connection, she had just found out about Baba through Joel Mednick uh, in Florida, and she had come up to, up to uh, North Carolina to help my brother, who was moving 
to, to where I lived in Cullowee, North Carolina. So I met my wife then, and uh, we were married in 1977, uh, the year I uh, graduated from Western Carolina University. And Baba was very much a part of our lives in, that, in those early days. And Wanda was a, ver was a nurse, so she had a real salary, and she had a vehicle. <laughs> I didn't even know how to drive. <laughs> So we kind of moved in together, and um, she, uh, 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 we were, we had a, a date set for our wedding, and so we had bought some clothes, and she had a wedding dress, all those kinds of things that go along with getting married. And it was an extremely bitter winter that year, and we were living in a a, a, a frame house, a wood frame house, that had wood stoves, and. Uh, we started a fire in the wood stove because the landlord told us it was fine. The house caught fire and burned to the ground. Uh, so Baba really wanted us to have a fresh start. We lost just about everything. We, we managed to keep a, uh, a few items. And Wanda's most precious things were her nursing pins, which were gold, and her Red Cross pins and all these things that, that sh from her nursing career. And we had forgotten that we had several precious Baba things and so we dug through the ashes and found a few things and in the box with her nursing pin was a postcard and inside that folded postcard was a bit of Baba's hair and it was in a little plastic sleeve and uh, my mom had given it to my wife to be Wanda and Monty had given it to her and it was intact everything in the house burned except for the things in that box and they were all charred that Baba's hair was laminated in that plastic bag but it was it was safe so that was that was a real sweet little blessing from Baba um, n not too long after that in the early 80s uh, we became more and more involved with uh, we went to the center real regularly and we were also associated with the Atlanta Baba Group. And the Atlanta Baba Group uh, decided they were going to have a Sahabas. So they booked a, a camp outside of Atlanta called Camp Waco. I'm not sure if it was Waco or Waco. I think it was Waco. But it was our first, our first Southeast gathering. Is what it, was. it wasn't even called that then, I don't think. I think it's, I think it's Atlanta Sahabas or something like that. But Charles Haynes was there, lots of Baba people were there, and we were on our own. We had to cook our own food, and it was a very, it was splendid, but it wasn't, because it was the first time we had done it, it was very formative, and fairly cold, as I recall, and rainy, and, but it was, it was glorious. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is that I then became involved with the Atlanta group, and the Southeast Gathering was born in the, in the years following that, and I became very involved in the Southeast Gathering and uh, went to dozens of years of the Southeast Gathering and became, uh, uh, was a helper. I do the auction, uh, I was MC one time. I do a lot of paintings of Baba. I was in charge of the stage for many years. So the South, Southeast Gathering has been one of the things besides coming to the Mayor Center that uh, I uh, uh, hold very dear and treasure very much. Uh, I'm looking at my notes. Um, so I had a daughter, Leela, Leela Grace, um, was born in 1981. And we moved around the corner and built a house, uh, my wife and I, and uh, had another daughter, Ada, uh, Ada Elizabeth. Um, both of my kids have a little Baba connections with their names, as you can tell. And I also uh, uh, worked at the university as an artist and a as a gallery person. and. Uh, after I got my master's degree, I was able to become a professor of art and design at a local community college, which I did until 2003, at which time my parents had moved to Hawaii. And Wanda and I decided, let's move to Hawaii. She was tired of, of living in Western North Carolina. It was a little bit mm, redneck, I guess, for us uh, who, who had come from a very liberal family. And, uh, you know, uh, so we pulled up roots and moved to Hawaii. So lived in, in Hawaii for 12 years. And we have only been back from Hawaii a little over five years. But the real reason, people say, oh, what did you come back for? You're supposed to retire to Hawaii. 
And Hawaii was wonderful. Uh, there, were, there was a few Baba lovers there, and it's obviously extremely beautiful. And Baba wanted us there. It was, there's no doubt because he just showered grace on us. Uh, we ended up being able to purchase a house for way below market value. I ended up working for a picture framer and ended up buying the picture framing business from him for a real good price. And it started doing real well. So by the time I was tired of Hawaii, not really tired of Hawaii, you know what it was? I was missing my Baba family. I grew up with the center, the Southeast Gathering. This is my real, real family. And more than anything, that's the reason that we came back from Hawaii. There wasn't, my Baba family just wasn't there. There was a couple, but it was just nothing like coming to the center and seeing when I come to the center now, I see people I've known for 50 years. And there's, that's the most precious thing to me. And I really missed that when I was living in Hawaii. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about one more thing. Um, I, st I stayed in Hawaii. We stayed in Hawaii until 2015, at which time we sold the house and the business. And my wife was having some health problems. We didn't have to work anymore. Baba took us back to our paid-for home in North Carolina, and Juan and I both managed to retire. And so all I do now is fish, travel, and paint. I still love to paint and paint many, many Baba paintings as well as all kinds of other things. So I'm, I'm living my dream. Recently, Baba allowed Juan and I to get a condo in Myrtle Beach, which I said I'd never do, and Baba had other, other ideas. I uh, did want to mention that some of these stories are in my dad's book, Footprints in the Sand. And um, this is uh, another book of his uh, known as Souls of Fire, which I really recommend. Stories of Milarepa, uh, Rabia of Basra, uh, Ramakrishna, uh, Teresa, St. Teresa Hafez. Very good introduction to uh, mystical uh, uh, saints and masters of the past. And it's a good writer. Um, I, will, I would like to do another uh, uh, talk about my parents and, and some of the, some of the, because they never really did this kind of thing, had a, a video taken of them talking about Baba. And I know some wonderful, precious stories that I could, I could relate. Uh, so that's for the next chapter. So I do have a, another little story or two that I want to relate to you, because these are really precious things to me. Uh, during the 80s, my, my, my dad and mom took our entire family to India uh, and another time took our entire family and spouses and children that were of age and his sister who was a woman named Corinne who became a, a wonderful Baba lover and Betty Brown who has, has come, continued to come to the center over the years since, since my aunt Corinne has died and she's almost like family to us. But uh, the reason that I wanted to bring this up is I wanted to paint when I was in India because I, was, I knew from my trips to India that there was a lot of downtime. There was hot times of the day, there was times when there was just no activities, and I'm kind of high-strung individual, and I, I needed to paint. But I didn't really have any materials. The first time that I did this, that I painted, in fact it was that first trip to India, I needed art supply, so I went to see my good friend Pandi, who, who painted uh, Baba photographs. Many of the older painted photographs of Baba were, were by Pandi. And he arranged for me to, ha to get some art supplies, some brushes and some acrylic paints, and a piece of, uh, of canvas, stretch canvas. I, I, mean, I knew how to do all that, I just didn't have the materials for it. But on subsequent trips, I. I decided, you know, it's once I go to get a painting done, all I can really do is leave it. And so I, I did leave several there. Oh, that reminds me. There is a painting of mine that I did in 1974, 73 or 74, in the library on the hill. And uh, uh, Arnavas, they, they got ready to take it down because it wasn't signed or anything. And she says, oh, no, that must stay. That's, that's, a, that's a special piece. So I heard that wonderful story after uh, Arnavas passed. But there's a couple of other uh, of my paintings floating around India. Uh, but on my 1988, I believe it was, uh, on one of these trips, all of all my family and relatives are all going through Heathrow, and then they go to, 
and I found this this basket of buttons at a closed uh, uh, restaurant or grocery store, and I had ding. All I have to do is paint over this button with I, I knew how to do that with gesso and paint, and I could paint a baba button, a hand painted baba button. So I started doing those in India. So. And Baba provided it because he, I asked for a private room and they gave me a private room, which meant I could have all my paints laid out on the little table there and I could, I could walk away and leave the door and so I'd be halfway uh, finished with paintings and they'd be cluttering all over the desk. So I did this for several trips in a row. But only one of these trips in the 80s, I had done several, that they, they were getting better each time because I was trying to, I was getting, figuring out how to do them at a small size. Now, anyone that has ever painted a painting of Baba knows how, what a powerful meditation it is. Uh, this is a couple of, of my, my recent Baba buttons. These are fairly large, so they'll show up on, on camera. Now, generally, they're, they're a little smaller than this. And uh, during that time, after I, I would paint one, I would just give them away. Well, I gave, I distinctly remember I gave one to Erich, and he's so gracious. He, oh, oh, Roger, I said, please, I want you. He goes, he touched it here and he put it away. Not another word was said. He didn't make a fuss about it or anything. Mani was like, oh, how beautiful. Oh, I love it so much, Roger. Thank you so much. And then I also gave one to Jal Dastur, whom I, he became real fast buddies with too. My dad was also very close with Jal Dastor, as he was with Erich and uh, Mani, of course. Um, so years went by, and I came back in the 90s. And uh, I was outside the Samadhi, and uh, Dali Dastor comes up to me and she says, Roger, could I see you for a minute? She took me aside, and she had a little uh, uh, kerchief, and she unwrapped the button that I had given to Jaw. It looked like he dragged it behind the car. I mean, it looked like he had put it on the ground and just ground his foot, and I said, Dolly, what happened? She said, well, Roger, Jaw wears this every day, but he wears it inside his Western clothes because he's, being a Parsi, he, he has a, a sadra on underneath his, his Western clothes. So he would put the button on the sadra and then put his Western clothes over it. And so the abrasion of the Western clothes had rubbed the surface off the button. And she goes, could you repair this? I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> of course, I'd love to, you know. But I thought that was so precious that, that you know, uh, I'd given it just, it was gone. But then to hear that he wore it all the time was so precious to me. But the really, really precious thing was that within a week or two of that incident, I had gone to Marizad. Now, in these days, this was uh, uh, when I had given Mani her button. She was lively and up and walking about. So this was when Mani was using a little motorized wheelchair, a little cart that she drove around, which is so cute. Uh, she wasn't walking as quite as well. But, uh, and the Marizad hours had gotten much, much shorter. When I was there in the 70s, we would spend hours in Mondeley Hall. Uh, I mean, we'd have morning sessions, afternoon sessions. I got to cuddle up next to Eric for hours on end. And he would, like, hit me on the knee and say, wake up, you know. <laughs> I was just a kid. But uh, so here I was back with my, my family, and we'd gone to Marizad, and here comes Bonnie over from the women's side. And I look up, and she's wearing the button that I had given her. And I said, oh, Baba, how sweet that is. That, oh, that just, oh. It makes just it made my day, my month, my year, whatever. And so she was greeting. The greeting line was going on, as you know. And Casey was standing next to me. And I leaned over to Casey and I said, Casey, how sweet of Bonnie. She knew I was coming. And so she wore the button I painted. And Casey says, oh, no. That's one of her favorite things. She keeps it on top of her jewelry case. And I have to say, with all sincerity, there's never been an artist that I've ever known that has had greater fortune than to have God's own sister cherish 
a painting that I did of her brother, her god, the god, and it be her preferred button to wear. If I if I had the greatest accolades of any artist in history, they wouldn't touch that in terms of precious experiences. That's all. So that was, that's like my most precious story. Because, I mean, <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I thought, oh, that's just, you know, and they were extremely thoughtful. If they knew you were coming, you would get the royal treatment. And I thought that's what this was. When she came out and I said that to Casey, Casey was taken aback. She says, oh, no. <laughs> that's like really precious to her. She, so, 